Hello and welcome to another Hangout on Air on Engagement Broadcasting. We live, whether we like it or not, in a data-driven universe. Everything we do online, whether we click on something or not click on it, whether we pass it around or not, whether we comment or engage with it in any way, is actually a signal. It means something to somebody, it means something to us, it means something to the way we're perceived. All this, however, is driven by data and how we unpack it, how we actually get signal from all that apparent noise is exactly what this, this Hangout on Air is all about. We have a full house today. We have John from Nodex who will be coming in and to tell us all about it. We have Alex wrangling your comments, so make sure that they're there. And we have Virginia and Mindy from Bruce Clay Inc. coming in, coming in with a perspective and bringing in their questions. Well, let's start with John. John, hi. Hey, David. Everyone, thanks for being here. Thanks for having us. Uh, thank you very much. And we're going to start start off with with the last hangout on air we did, which was with Bruce Clay himself. And we want to sort of have a little bit of a look about the impact. And like every hangout on air, we usually do it in a very professional way. We start with a, a pre hangout publicity um, period. We have the hangout on air itself, and then we have a post hangout engagement period. So we're going to try and unpack all of those. So if we start with your view on this, please. Yeah, absolutely. So like you said, we've got the pre-event activity, the actual event activity, and then we have post-event activity. And so what Nodex is able to let us do is see snapshots in time uh, related to that timeline. Um, so I will do a quick screen share with you to show you uh, an overview of what we've seen. Um, so this, the event was on March 11th. Our time frame here is from March 10th through March 13th. Uh, and our reach during that period of time for the hashtag SMT Power Talk was 2.7 million people. We had 61 authors, um, 89 total posts across Google+, Twitter, and Facebook. So we've got 29% coming from G+, 66% on Twitter, and then 4% on Facebook. Um, so this kind of gives us a, a, an overview perspective on our event, again, pre, during, and post event. Hey guys, John. Yeah. YouTube is giving me an error here. I'm going to shut down the stream for one second, okay. change a configuration, and start it up, tell everybody to hang out. I'm very sorry, but YouTube, I can't even tell if people are able to watch right now. Okay, so okay. No problem. Are you able to see Let me... I'm just curious. So we would start okay, from the very we're beginning. Back. We're back, guys. Go for it. Hey, sorry for that technical glitch. <laughs> um, should I recap again what we're talking about here, or are we good yeah, to go? Yeah, if you would mind. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, sure. Okay. I'll just start over. apologize if you've seen this a minute ago, but I'll uh, just do a quick recap again. So we're talking about um, one day prior to the event, which was on the 11th of this month, the event day, and then a few days uh, post-event. And during that period of time, we were able to reach 2.7 million people um, with 61 authors, 89 total posts across Google+, Twitter, and Facebook. And um, the percentages here represent the total number of, of posts distributed across the network. So we had 29% of the conversation was happening on G+, 66% on Twitter, and 4% on Facebook, although as many of you may know, there's a, a large difference between the types of conversations that are able to go on across the different networks. So Twitter is obviously limited by character count, um, so the conversation is in shorter bursts. So it may appear as though, in fact, there are more tweets than G plus posts, but the conversation, as we'll see in a little bit, looks a good bit different between those, between those networks. Awesome. Okay, easy questions first. We, we reached 2.7 million people. Um, what drives that? What can we do to increase that? So um, I think a lot of it has to do with, um, well, obviously, the people involved. So we're talking engagement broadcasting, which means bringing people into the conversation. But the question is, well, what people are interested in this conversation? Who do we bring into the conversation? Who wants to join the conversation? 
Um, because you can send your message into a room of people that don't care, aren't interested, and your resonance is going to be small to none. But if you send it into a room full of people who are very interested in the topic you're discussing, the resonance increases dramatically. Um, and by resonance, I think that's maybe a technical, a little bit of a technical term, but that simply means when I reshare, a, for example, a post, the activity that that reshare receives, whether that be large or small, is the amount of resonance it's getting. So if a lot of, if a lot of people are engaging on the reshare of a particular post, that means my audience resonates with it. Um, and, and so those are the people that we want to identify. And that's the affinity of the subject, really, isn't it? And from a marketing point of view, it's aligning what you do with the interests of the people you're actually, um, with an inverted commas, targeting for Absolutely. that kind of content. Great. OK? So, so essentially, once, yeah, right, yeah. once we've identified, sorry, just to continue here, just once we've identified the people who are interested, who do resonate with this topic, it's a matter of connecting with them, uh, encouraging them to reshare, and spread the message through networks. So and That's so easy, uh, isn't it? Because all we have to do is just tell them, reshare this or else. Right. That's easy, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, it's, it's not, really. It's not. So how would we do this from a technical point of view? I mean, what can we do to actually make sure the connection is as relevant as possible? Well, um, as we've discussed in the past, it's really about connecting it with your audience specifically. So my audience differs from your audience. When I reshare a post, my introduction to that reshare would be geared for my audience. Or if you're sharing into a particular community, um, it would be geared towards that community. So we've got, I've shared this event, for example, into a business community that I help moderate. Well, because I know that that, that community is focused on small businesses on Google+, my introduction to the reshare will differ. It will be specific to uh, small businesses using Google+. So I may say, OK, here's, here's some things you can do on Google+, Plus to bring the conversation to more people. You know, you can plus mention, you can ask people to reshare, what have you. Um, but it's, it's, it's a connection between um, a specific audience and, and the topic at hand. Brilliant. OK, and um, Alex, do you have any comments at this point from the audience? We do. So we have yet another Bruce Clay, Inc. Uh, employee joining us. It's Christy Kellogg. And she asks, uh, she's curious about the 2.7 million reach with the SMT Power Talk. Can means? Yes. Um, basically, that is the number of people who have seen these posts. So that's irrespective of whether they've engaged on it or not. Um, basically, if, 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 it has, if the post has shown up in the view or in the stream of a person, then that counts as a view. Uh, and then beyond that, you've got the engagement metrics. So the plus ones, the comments, the reshares, or retweets of the actual posts. And we can see those as well, but that's a, that's a separate metric. The, the 2.7 is eyeballs on the topic, basically. Okay. And I think that's an important point to make because essentially, you know, we talk about the attention economy. We're talking about bringing things to people's attention and, and making them see it. But seeing it isn't enough if you want to go further. There right. has to be the kind of impact that generates engagement. Absolutely. And, and that impact is <clears throat> we often break it down between what we call influencers and what we call engagers. Um, and Nodex allows us to see that activity graphed. Um, because we're visual people, we try and present the data in a way that, that makes visual sense, not just number sense. You know, I can say we have 157 nodes and 19% original posts, 28% comment, et cetera, et cetera. But those are just numbers. But to see it graphed out with a little explanation can really be uh, helpful to understand that conversation in a broader sense. Um, right. So John, if you could yeah. go ahead, David. I was going to say, no, uh, you're going to bring up a graphic, and I was hoping you would. Yes. John, if you want to pull up the um, engager uh, perspective, or I could just do a quick screen share here. You just tell me what you need. There's engager Google+. That's it? Perfect. I'm all loaded in. 
Absolutely. So okay, so we're, we're here, we're looking at the engager perspective. So the larger nodes or dots on this graph are representing those people who have been most active within this topic. And again, this is one day prior, day, the event day, and, and several days following. So what we're seeing here in the center of the graph are large orange nodes. The orange ones represent um, the plus one activity. So these people in the center of the graph have plus one all of these posts in the, it, it, that are connected to them. And we could zoom in with Nodex and see this a little closer. But essentially, these large orange nodes represent your engagers. So these are the types of people who, throughout a, a campaign or an event like this, you would want to maintain a connection with and say, you know, thanks a lot for engaging or, you know, for, from an internal perspective, you might consider these to be your brand advocates um, types of, of people. And then uh, further than that, Nodex breaks it down by uh, percentage here. So we can see that 19% of the conversation were original, <clears throat> original posts. 28% were comments, which to me says, you know, this, this topic is more of a conversation which is typical of Google+. Plus. I mean, people are here because there's an interaction potential here. There's a, lot, there's a lot deeper of a conversation that can occur just because of the differences in networks, but you don't always, even on Google+, Plus, see this kind of engagement. Um, and this is the kind of metric that differentiates engagements from broadcasting, I think. I think that's yep. kind of an important piece to pull out of this. Yep. And I think it's important to, to bring in, John, to what you just said, that although we're talking about brand advocates and identifying influencers, at the end of the day, it's relationships, right? Because we are connecting with people, whether you're a brand or a company or a person, you still need to connect with those people on in a way that the relationship develops, which means that you need to have a clear idea what each of you want from that relationship, how it's going to go forward, what is the value proposition of any continued contact, um, pretty much like a real-life relationship. Really, so it is. is yeah, worth bearing in mind. Absolutely. I mean, definitely. I found that just connecting with people in the very, in the most human way possible benefits everyone concerned. I mean, at the end of the day, like you said, we have all these pretty dots on the screen, but it represents a person. And it represents the relationships between people, just like in real life. Uh, because I, it is real life. I mean, just out, know, of curiosity. Just out of curiosity. It's not in the same room, doesn't mean it's not real. <laughs> <laughs> That's so true. And just out of curiosity, how easy is it for the average person to actually mine that data from by using Nodex? It's really surprisingly easy to get started. Um, basically, what we've done here is we've set up Nodex to track a hashtag. Um, so we've got it tracking this hashtag, and it's tracking it across networks. But to set it up, you just give the project a name. You tell it, all right, here's the hashtag we want to track, here are the networks we want to track it on, and save. And at that point, Nodex will begin to receive the data from the different sources. So Google Plus will send in data, and Twitter will send in data, and Instagram, and Facebook. And then um, in a few hours, Nodex will begin to collect and, and analyze that data for you. So this, um, it's kind of a you know, start it, sit back, let it happen kind of thing at first. Okay, that's great. Um, we're talking about reach and influence and engagement. Um, from your point of view, what could we do to actually improve on all those things? How would we approach it differently? Connect with people. <laughs> just like, just, it's really almost as basic as that. Um, but connect with the, the right people. You know, connect with the people who are interested in your conversation. Um, and I, I particularly like that we have, or that you all, that Social Media Today has done a series of these because now we're developing an audience of interested people, kind of sifting out people who are uninterested from those who are very interested. And uh, what Nodex allows us to do is see those people uh, in a very uh, kind of top-down sort of way. So we get lists of people who are influential, we get lists of people who are engaging, um, and, and again, across networks. So I can see, all right, on Facebook, you know, these are the people that we want to be connecting with. Um, here on Twitter, you know, these are the type, these are the people that we would we would like to connect with. 
um, and broaden that conversation um, the same on Google Plus. So it's, uh, I would connect with people. Okay. Um, here's, a, here's a question. Um, well, I'm, I'm going to bring in hopefully Mindy or, or Virginia. Um, both are actively engaged within the Bruce Clay um, company and, and, and Mindy in particular is in, is in charge of training in-house which must be one of those jobs of trying to have the issue with a spoon because as soon as you get something done the, the picture changes. So I would like to get both their perspective and questions really if possible um, in, in this kind of thing. So uh, Mindy, um, if, you want, if you have any questions or anything you need to bring up. Well, I have to say, I mean, I like what both you and John have brought up. I don't know if you saw me in the corner. I kept nodding my head, like, up and down. But, you know, we need data. We need to know what works. There's no doubt in my mind. We have to know, you know, is, did this post work? Was it effective? Like, you've shown what's the reach, what's the engagement with it. But, you know, I come from a perspective of a very strong marketing background, too, and I used to teach college courses in communication that, you know what, it is the human being on the other side. So whether we're in a digital world or not, we have to understand who our audience is, and to understand who your audience is, I mean, take a look at, you know, what are they talking about socially, how are they engaging, what, what seemed to speak the most to them before, and even using the right words, because anytime we communicate, whether it's like we are now, or even an email, or whatever it might be in person, we're thinking about how does this message impact me. So from a marketing perspective, we do it subconsciously. It's just what we do. Even when my husband talks to me, I'm thinking, okay, is this a to-do on my list for me or what? But we have to make sure that we create our message so we get right to that point. You know, this is how it's going to impact you. This is what you're going to get from the message. But again, it goes back to the understanding the audience so that when you are saying that, you're making sure it does align with their interests and their needs. And I know in internally we do um, surveys with our, in our within our training course. So I mean, um, Virginia can talk about that too some more, but um, I mean it is a big thing. So we have to understand the technology technology side, but of course we can never forget about the human beings that we're actually interacting with too. Awesome, awesome. That's really cool. And can I ask? I mean, your job must be I mean it's a constantly moving target essentially because as soon as you finish training, what sort of in one perspective, another comes in. How do you tackle that? <laughs> it's ongoing. It's nonstop. So my role, I train. I train our clients. So we have in-person training. So I train our clients. I also people come into our training courses. Plus I do the internal training. But literally, we do a training every other month. That's in California, and we're constantly having to change our materials because well, one, there's the Google screenshots that like change daily. <laughs> so as soon as you got the SERP, it's changed. But things are evolving, so I mean, it's just a constant reading, staying up to date. We do a lot of testing, too, so we incorporate anything we do with testing with our training, but it's just constant. I know that's kind of a canned response, but it is. It's just a constant process. I can, I can, I can well imagine. And I see a lot of organizations, and the most responsive ones manage to somehow get the information flowing mm -hmm. across the entire organization, so they're constantly sharing best practices, knowledge, points of view, which seems to... Um, create um, a connection of cognitive surplus, if you like, within the organization and, and, and power it up. Right, and that's what we do too. I mean, we have, because we are an agency, we have a lot of different teams, but there's collaboration, there's knowledge share between them too. So our SEM team, you know, they come across the golden golden nugget of information that needs to pass be passed to the SEO team or the content team. So there is that, within an organization, you have to have that collaboration too, and again, you know, the training is part of it, but a lot of talk because there's experts. There's going to be multiple experts within an organization too. Can I, yeah, can I ask a, a difficult question here? Because one of the one of the obstacles, and I use you know, obstacles within inverted commas really, um, is when knowledge is shared across organizations, that um, sort of um, obstacle has to be overcome is the, the personal expertise that a person brings in, which may be questioned or maybe um, sort of uh, looked at. In, in, in a very careful detail at another part of the organization. How do you tackle this? How do you deal with this internally? Well, we're a little bit different in how we do things, and I'm sure Bruce touched on, I actually know he touched on this um, when he did this pre when he did the interview. But I mean, when we bring anyone in, you know, we bring people who have the ranges, people who have very little experience in search, and we train them from the ground up. And we have people who come in with experience, but regardless, we're training them. We're, we have them take our courses. They have to take it 
especially in the SEO side, they have to take it twice in a row. So it's the same thing. But that way we know we're all speaking the same language and we're coming from the same place. And I think that is a huge part of it because then there is that trust. You start building that trust because you know that your core methodology, your core principles are the same and each person is reading up on a certain subject. And even within our organization, like I know within the SEO team, there's people, there's analysts who spend more time researching local SEO. There's ones who research more um, on the technical side and same thing within each team. So again, like I said, if the foundations, you share the same foundation, same groundwork being built up the same way, I think that goes a long way with trust when information is shared. That's really cool. And again, I mean, that's in many ways, it reflects what John was talking about earlier about the alignment of values. Mm -hmm. He was talking about an external environment, but you are doing it incredibly well with an, in, an internal one. That's really cool. Um, Virginia, do you want to, to ask any questions in terms of all these other things we've talked about up to now? Yeah, this has been really interesting, um, especially because I kind of feel that. Um, Talking about relationships, right? Like when the invitation to have Bruce on uh, as your guest last week or a couple weeks ago, whenever it was, um, that was uh, a big victory in our content uh, team here. And I think that um, you you mentioned the fact that the, the the company has a great brand presence on Google Plus, which is actually the success of many people because. Um, there's multiple people. There's Paula, Alan, there's Christy Kellogg, there's Chelsea Adams, and myself. And we all are the community managers. We've all um, got this responsibility to speak for the brand, which means that the education piece is, of course, in, in place. The ab ability to call upon other departments so that we can speak, um, you know, cohesively and uh, to the brand. Um, so. It's really interesting to, to get to see um, some of this data that uh, Nodex can pull to, to show the kinds of efforts that we're doing here in the department as community managers to see the influence and the reach. And um, I, I had to go ahead and check out the Nodex site since we've just even been chatting, started my uh, free sign up and I'll have to import a project and see what I can I can get from here because I I know that um, social media is can be hard to quantify and branding can be hard to you know to talk about ROI with but if I can report on the impact of getting Bruce on this HOA and what that meant you know for our, for our reach and and and, and see pretty nodes and, and like, you know, <laughs> the, the, the dots that represent the people. Yeah. Um, that's really cool. And I will just add, I guess, um, to the point about how it's all about relationships. Um, there are some, some people on Twitter and um, people we've had, uh, you know, some correspondence with in the past on social media and through the comments on the HOA, um, we've gotten more engagement. And so this idea of an engagement broadcast is, is cool. Um, there were people who were kind of have more like brand style uh, handles on Twitter. And then we learn their names in the comments uh, on, on Google Plus. And so now we have a name to go with the brand and the person. And it's, it is, it's personal relationship building. It's a, it's a very humanizing influence, isn't it, really? <clears throat> yes, very humanizing. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Um, there's another graph we could talk about, a little bit about, the content type graph, um, John. And this, what this shows us is the types of content people are preferring um, to share. It's, it's, yeah, there we go. OK, so the day of the event, March 11th here, people video was was a more uh, prevalent content type. The day after the event, people were sharing articles, which is interesting to me because it obviously the day of the event, you know, people are sharing the event video, right? But the day after the event is when uh, people share the context of the conversation, you know. Um, so that that's that's something else that Nodex can can provide to us uh, data-wise, visually. Um, which I find very helpful. 
Mm. Isn't that interesting? Because I think in context, you know, it's like a real life conversation. You don't you don't sort of meet somebody in a bus stop and start with a speech, right? <laughs> you you sort of have a, a very social kind of engagement interaction. And I think in terms of what we did with the Hangout on Air, the initial impact of a visual medium, uh, it started off with um, a very short introduction video of Bruce Clay talking different events and explaining his point of view. And then he followed up with Hangout on Air itself. That creates a very strong impact point for everybody to share and actually engage with and think about. But once they've done that, then they need deeper, perhaps longer, more articulated content, which is provided by the article environment. Absolutely, absolutely. I also liked the uh, the poll that you all put together for for people to um, be active with because it's very engaging. I I engaged it. I was like, heck yeah, I want to <laughs> present my opinion in this poll. I want to I want to see what other people think. Um, I really thought that that poll was a very very good element to bring into it. It was, it was, and Alex was instrumental in driving it forward. Alex, have we got any comments up to now or anything? Um, and if not, can you tell us a little bit about the poll and what you did to push it? Sure. I mean, just as far as the comments go, right now there's just a lot of love for Nodex. So, uh, John D., yeah. what, you and Lee, what you and Lee are doing right now, uh, people are very happy with you, especially Kara Wood. Kara Wood did this. She did like an all caps, like, no, Dex is awesome. And then she clarified in a later comment, she's like, I'm not yelling at you. I'm just that excited. I was like, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, but the, the, the way that the poll works out, um, it was actually really great to see how Bruce handled it. But basically, what we do, just to like, you know, a peek behind the curtain. David comes up with the different elements of the poll, and then I put them together, and then John Ellis creates the graphic for it. And really, what I try to do during the event is I just encourage people to keep going back to it, because it's really easy to forget, you know, like, sometimes I'll even, I'll be like, what was my answer to the poll? And uh, Google, the Google poll feature is really nice in uh, reminding you what you chose, but getting people to go back to it and just reminding them throughout the event, hey, we have this poll, do you remember, you know, do you want to change your answer? And though the answers didn't change that much, when I brought it up, Bruce did a really great, you know, he just, he, he took over. He was like, he was like, I just want to point out, these are the reasons why people would stick with these different answers. And I thought that was just so fantastic of him to break that down for everybody. But definitely. And I think the, he made some very deep um, points on that subject which resonated with a lot of people who actually thought about them. So it was really impressive having his perspective um, when we did. Absolutely. Uh, do we have any comments on the stream or anything which we need to address it before we move on to the next uh, um, subject? Not in you. Please move forward. Okay. All right. So let's look at the, um, John, if it's okay with you, can we look at the post hangout activity and actually see um, how that went and for how long? Yes. Um, we can look at um, the top days graph, which mm -hmm. basically shows us uh, an engagement, a different kind of engagement perspective. Um, we've got Wednesday, Thursday, Tuesday, Friday, Saturday. Um, so the event was on Wednesday, but then on Thursday, we had almost the same amount of engagement. And then um, Tuesday, which would have been the prior day, you know, we see um, a slightly uh, less engagement. And then we've got top times, which also helps kind of see um, a new perspective. So 6 p.m., and these are in UTC. So, David, these are more in your time than in my time. Um, but so 6 p.m., which I believe was the time of the event. Am I? Is that correct? It is. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. It was. So we see the most engagement at 6 p.m., and then it drops off a bit. 10 p.m., 11 p.m., 12 p.m., 3 p.m., and 4 p.m. So I mean, this is not unusual. But for a, maybe a topic that you want to become influential in, or a topic that you want to begin engaging, um, this kind of information can be very helpful because now we can see, if we didn't already know, the best times and days to be, to be engaging the conversation. Yeah. Um, and these are, these are spread out across networks, but you can narrow them down 
into say, okay, on Google Plus, the conversation was happening on Wednesday at 6 p.m., but on Twitter, it was a Tuesday at 4 p.m., and then using uh, scheduling tools, like we've got Buffer integrated, you can use that <clears throat> kind of analysis and really connect with the conversation at the right time and the right day. It's, it's quite powerful, really. And I suppose from a learning, a marketing learning point of view, although we didn't do it, we could actually prepare post-hangout material we, which yes. we could use at those times to actually boost the conversation. I mean, we let it flow organically. You know, we take part in the comments. We sort of um, come into the conversation as we're pinged, etc. But we don't actually, at the moment, have material which can give it a boost as the uh, conversation spreads and perhaps begins to flag a little bit, so it can be rejuvenated. But it's Absolutely. something we could look at. Yeah. Yeah, I think if I think that's a very good point. We've been talking a lot about the pre-event and you know, sharing activity and sharing different perspectives pre-event, like the poll and some images and things. And then obviously on the event day, there's a lot of activities, so people are engaged. But I think that's a very good point, post-event, to be sharing content that's related. So, <clears throat> I mean, with Nodex, we could see the next day or even a few hours later. All right, you know, here's your activity. Here's what it looks like. Here's Here are the people that have been involved. Um, you know, or, you know, this is the type of content people are preferring right now. Uh, Nodex is, 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 it can show you live data, practically speaking. I mean, it's a few minutes delayed, but you can see this stuff in real time, which resonates with people, I, I think, uh, big time. I mean, just thinking out loud here, but about the connection between Twitter and, you know, the new Firehose deal with Google, that's real-time data, basically. Google, Google understands the relevancy and the value of real-time live data. And so Nodex can do that in a very targeted way for any of these events. Um, so yeah, if we were sharing screenshots or short video clips post-event, I think that would, that would significantly impact the, that total reach number, which is 2.7 million. But next time, man, I'm saying 4 million. <laughs> Yeah, and I think that's in, it's interesting, really, because we're talking about the velocity of data here. Um, in order to accelerate it, we need to create relevant impact points, um, which means that, you know, as marketers, if we were to, to create the perfect Hangout event, what would you advise us to do? All of the above. I mean, it would be, <laughs> it would be pre-event, you know, um, taking information, taking polls, taking screenshots, taking short snippets of the conversation that is going to be taking place and, sh and, and connecting that with the audience that, have, that has been identified with Nodex. And then obviously the event day, um, again, connecting with those people. It's great to have Alex here um, connecting with the comment stream and bringing people into the conversation as it happens. Um, and then post-event, you know, doing, it's a similar idea to the, to the pre-event, except now we've got more content to share, to take snippets of, to break break that conversation down and analyze it a bit for people, I think that really uh, broadens people's understanding of the event. I know for myself, for example, I mean, if I sit there and I watch an event, that's one level of understanding that I can get from the information being presented. Or I can watch the event and take notes. Mm -hmm. Or I can watch the event and have someone else have had those notes taken sort of for me and presented to me. Um, in, in little snippets um, post-event. I think that that would deepen my understanding of the content being having been presented. I Absolutely. And I think, um, you know, what Alex pointed out earlier, where uh, Bruce Clay on the event itself um, explained why some people think SEO is dead. I mean, that's so easy to miss in, in, in an hour-long hangout on air where we talked about so many different things. But if you isolate it and take that nugget on its own, suddenly you have almost, in, in a sort of two, three second video, the entire encapsulated philosophy of Bruce Clay himself talking about it in, in a very knowledgeable way, and that increases the impact of the interaction. Absolutely. He had so many quotes that post-event, we were all quoting his, his talk in different ways, and it, it really, each one became its own conversation piece. You know, it was kind of a micro-conversation, but yeah, when you have a guest like Bruce on, man, <laughs> There's a lot of uh, potential and opportunity there. I think it's quite fascinating to see that left on it to its own devices, the conversation happens in almost the same way that it would in a real 
world setting. You know, you sort of create a bit of a buzz in the beginning. There's anticipation how things are going to happen. It sort of begins to peak to the event itself when it actually happens, and then it naturally peters out as you know people get busy with their lives and other things come into it. Um, and that each of those areas, each of those segments, can almost have its own bell curve, if you like. So if we create the right kind of relevant material, which will actually create a, a beginning, a middle, and an end for each of those segments, then the greater bell curve which is created will actually be a lot bigger. Yes, yes, absolutely. With this kind of data, we can really interject that into that bell curve and say, there's really more of a conversation that we haven't had yet, so let's have that conversation. Brilliant. Um, uh, Virginia, is there anything which you'd like to bring in at this point? Hmm. Um, well, I guess I could I ask a little bit more about Nodex and like yeah, how. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, definitely. The opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> um, once I create a new project, is that going to be based on um, my brand, a certain hashtag or campaign? Um, yes, any all of the above are possible. So that's a very important question to ask because where you start will determine where you end up in a very big way. So in, in the case that we're looking at here, um, we're tracking the hash, a hashtag for SMT Power Talk, um, and then we're able to narrow our date range so we can then look at one event in the series of events that are going on. So in that way, you could, with a hashtag, track an event, or like a campaign. So if you've got, you know, Nike, all of these companies, they have hashtag campaigns, so you could start your project to track that campaign hashtag. Right. Or we, you could start a, top, a topical uh, a project. So if, you know, content marketing or copywriting or any of a number of different topics that you want to become uh, influential in or engage that audience, you can start a, a, a top, you can start a project, a Nodex project that's topically focused. So you can do that with either a hashtag that's central to that topic or a keyword, or a couple of keywords that are central to that topic. Um, you can also set Nodex up to track uh, social profiles. So if you want to see the activity of Bruce Clay mapped out, you can set your project to just track that activity. So then you'll see, well, your brand advocates, your influencers, your engagers, all related to Bruce Clay, or all related to your profile, or your competition's profile, or you see what I mean? There's a, there's a lot of different ways you can go about them. What's the reporting like then? Um, do I just check into my dashboard every week or...? Um... Yeah, es essentially that's you could do that. I mean, you can also set Nodex up to give you alerts based on certain events. So if you get a very positive post on Twitter, you can get an email sent to the person who needs to see that. Or if you see a very negative post on Google+, you get an email automatically sent to the person who needs to see that. And then if there's a bunch of positive posts, you get to send that to Bruce Clay, and he gets to smile and say, that's a good job. <laughs> you, but you see what I mean. You can, you can have Nodex basically send, uh, send emails to the, to the appropriate people. And, and at that point, yeah, you could check it you know, once or twice a week and then take snapshots and, and put that, uh, those visuals into uh, internal emails or training material um, you know, external emails, however you guys want to, you know, provide the data. Um, but yeah, that kind of reporting is definitely uh, encouraged even. I mean, I do that kind of stuff all the time. Sounds super powerful. <laughs> That's exciting. Um, Mindy, do you want to come in and design a question which you I would like? I have a question. Okay, so this is really cool. I'll be checking it out to you after I hang out. But so my question, John, with Nodex, you're talking about the trends, how you could see the before and the after and the activity on Twitter and the different days. Do you see a trend overall? Like, is there a general trend you see, or is it just dependent on, you know, the topic? I'm just curious. It's fascinating data, no doubt. Um, well, there's all kinds of trends that 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 I've seen. Um, it's topically dependent. It's it's um, conversationally dependent. It's network dependent. Um, but that's that's one of the reasons I like the filters that we're able to use in Nodex. So I can see the conversation that's happened on Twitter, and I can see, okay, people are preferring right now to share articles on Twitter or um, images on Twitter or, 
you know, videos or whatever. Um, or Google Plus, you know, this this conversation, this topic is is going on um, right now. People are preferring to share videos. Maybe I should get in there and I should share a video. Uh, or here I can see this is a top video that people are preferring. So that's that's a part of of the dashboard that we haven't discussed. But the top posts um, section shows you uh, either topically or for the specific network what the posts that have received the most engagement are. So that kind of gives me a sense of, well, in the last few days for this topic, here's the piece of content that is really resonating the most because it's getting the most engagement. So I can either go in and engage that content directly from the dashboard. I could go maybe look up that article and share it over on Twitter if I've seen it on Google+. Plus. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a lot of sort of trends and, and, and things of that nature that you can get out of the dashboard. If it brings it all in this one reporting suite, that's really useful because I find a lot of my time kind of checking the various Facebook insights or Twitter analytics, and um, that alone is a time saver for yeah. And that's Facebook. that's one of its goals. Um, uh, Lee Smallwood uh, created this tool to save time. Basically, we know the we kind of many of us already know the questions we need answered, um, but like you said, you've got to go all over the place to find it. Nodex is, is, is an opportunity to see all of that presented to you in one place. And it's sort of normalized. So I can see plus one activity similar to uh, favorites of tweets. You know, I, it's, it's kind of, it normalizes the, the, the metrics, if you will. That's awesome. And John, I think we're also getting into the stage where it will have an additional layer which will allow us to determine sentiment look at trust and distrust, is that right? Yeah, and that's a, a, a topic I touched on briefly, but yes, Nodex has an opinion analysis or a sentiment analysis that it runs on all of the data that it's collecting. So you can change the dashboard perspective to see um, people who are thinking positively towards your topic or negatively or neutrally and then interject into that conversation in a more intelligent way. So I can see, well, you know, as a company that is running some um, reputation management, it's important for me to understand where the negative conversation is happening because that's where I need to be spending a little bit extra time helping, that, helping to explain my perspective as a brand or as an individual and helping to uh, address any concerns customers or individuals may have uh, surrounding um, my company or my topic. Um, so yeah, opinion analysis and sentiment analysis um, is very much a, a part of what Nodex shows. Um, and you can also do that on a, on a gender basis. So you can say uh, men are thinking in this way about m my topic or women are thinking in this way or uh, brands, which is, which is one of the genders that we've, that we've used to break this data down. Um, you can see the brand conversation it's happening. I see all the ladies in the audience are smiling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. It makes perfect sense what you're saying there. I understand that. Um, quick question on this now. If um, we, we, you know, as we, as we move forward, really, is there a limit to the time period that you can actually set? I mean, could you actually set over, you know, a two-year period to look at a specific hashtag and how it's changed or a brand value and how it's changed? You can if you're running a supercomputer. <laughs> Yes, yes, Nodex will track uh, this data over time and it gives you historic, uh, it does give you historic data. Um, depending on the account level that you've got, yes, you can see we've got this event, for example, we've been tracking the hashtag SMT Power Talk since uh, January 23rd. So, yes, we can, we can see, um, we can go back in time and say, all right, over time, Who's been, who's been consistently influential within my topic space? Who has consistently been engaging uh, with, this, with this event? And, and really, that could be another level of uh, contact that you might have with that person um, because you can see the consistency over time. Um, yeah. <clears throat> and it helps understand the, the real value that drives a relationship, really, right? Because if, if you have 
consistent contact with specific individuals or even brands, then you begin to understand what the impact points are and where the alignment lies, which helps you um, develop better relationships. Absolutely. Absolutely. So over time, you can see not only who's influential and engaging, but what types of content they're, that they're preferring. And so, you know, based on that history, you can use that in the development of your future strategies. So, yeah. I think um, there's a, a very important comment that has come up. Uh, uh, Alex has pulled it up. Yeah, so it's, it's actually really relevant to what you're talking about. Kara Wood is giving us a, a peek into what's coming up. She says, Nodex will also soon pull out fake accounts and those with fake followers. That's pretty cool, in my opinion. Yeah, that's very and, helpful. Go yes, ahead. I suppose that, that's a signature profile, isn't it? Because although you can create a perceived social proof in terms of a fake account and, and, and buy fake followers, um, when you actually look at the data signature, it's really hard to hide the fact that it's fake, right? Yeah. It's as time-consuming and expensive to fake that kind of data as it is to just go ahead and make it real. <laughs> so... <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is part of the semantic web, isn't it, where the economy of scale which allowed shortcuts to be created is no longer there. So you may as well do the right thing. But I think Absolutely. it's important that Nodex will actually be able to filter out those fake accounts who still are out there um, and, and, and pull in data from real ones. Very helpful. A any you questions? Also, yeah. Sorry, David, but yeah, you can also, just speaking of cleaning up your data, you can exclude certain hashtags that you find to be, you know, spammy. So on Google+, Plus, you've got all these circle share type hashtags that can be very irrelevant. And so I, if I start seeing those in my projects, I can go in and edit the project to add that to an exclude list. And so at that point, Nodex would understand, well, I don't want to see uh, posts that contain these hashtags because they've been identified as, as irrelevant. Um, and you can do that with profiles also. So if there's a particular profile that's just putting out a bunch of junk, you can add that to an exclude list also. Um, so that can be helpful when cleaning up your data. Absolutely. Um, any questions from uh, either Virginia or Mindy at this point? I don't have any questions. I don't know about you, Virginia. I'm just uh, really glad to be able to see the tool in action on the Hangout that we watched so closely and um, figure I'll, I'll get to give it a try myself soon. Absolutely. I agree with Virginia, what she just said. That's um, great. Well, thanks. I, at least something of what we're saying is making sense. That's great. That's very helpful. It's true. There are a lot of moving parts to every Hangout on Air, to every marketing event, really. And having that kind of data um, and being able to pull it out and actually analyze it and look at it allows us to see where the practicalities of what we do, the technical aspects, actually come in so we don't waste time, we don't confuse the audience, and, and, and we don't fail to deliver the value which we promised. Um, John, is there anything else that you can tell us about how perhaps we can um, improve on these things or uh, you know how we can get a better picture of every hangout? Yes, let me share with you a uh, quick video that we've recorded. This is a new uh, a newer piece to Nodex which we haven't yet touched on but essentially this is a this is a hashtag graph that is tracking um, a conversation across social media just like we've been discussing but what it's able to do is overlay uh, information across the networks. So mm -hmm. if this would play for us, yeah. Okay, so this is this is resolving to, here we go, okay. This oh, wow. is, yeah, this is something. Okay, this is for a hashtag copywriting. And basically what it's doing is showing us kind of conversation nodes across networks based around this topic. So mm -hmm. we can see uh, Google Plus here, um, all throughout we're seeing Facebook, Twitter, uh, Instagram, and um, this is mapping human behavior. So people have a tendency of wanting to use similar words and similar hashtags uh, when discussing a topic. And um, I mean, this is normal human behavior, but now we're able to see it and 
uh, connect with that con with conversations, but but within sub conversations, so we can see uh, within the copywriting uh, space, if you will, what what are the sub conversations that are going on within that topic, um, and and we can connect uh, in an even deeper way um, with conversations that we would probably not even know were going on uh, otherwise. That's amazing. That's 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 fascinating, and it's basically looking at the way that it spreads from one network to the other as well, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. And how the conversation changes and the words change, uh, the hashtags change. Um, we can zoom in here, obviously this is Google Plus, we can see that conversation in detail. Um, and then moving over, we can see um, all the connected, the connected and relevant topics, advertising, social media, content, marketing. Uh, some of those are obvious, some of them may be less obvious. Um, and this is breaking it down uh, by persona. So 49% uh, male, 49% female, 1.21% uh, 1. 1, 1. unknown. So it, you know, it, there's a lot of, of, of information available that we can now visualize and, and break down and, and connect on a, like you said, David, it's a human level. These are all people, you know, having real conversations. Yep. Um, so we can we can join those conversations in a in a relevant way. Well, you know, we're looking at this, and there's no excuses anymore for automated marketing or even or even bad marketing, right? That's right. <laughs> okay, that's really cool. That's excellent. Um, as we getting near the end of our show, Alex, are there any comments there which we need to address? Uh, no, I just I did want to bring up uh, Peter Feldham when. You guys, when you guys were talking about post-event activity, he talked about doing an annotated timeline, uh, like John Dietrich does a lot when we do these. When like when we did the last one of uh, these recap shows, he went in and he added all those time markers, and it was actually really cool to see all of the activity that that got. So it is a great post-event thing to do. I know I only have two minutes to ask this question, but I'm wondering. Based on your experience, John, can you overkill coverage of an event? Can you go too far? I think you you probably could, and that's certainly something to keep in mind. I mean, over if you oversaturate with information, the information itself starts to lose focus. You, I mean, like maybe in photography, if you're taking a picture of a forest, you know, your point may be one tree in that forest, but you've taken a picture of, of too many trees. So, yeah, I think that that's an important piece to keep in mind. Don't oversaturate. Don't, you know, break down the information. Um, make it useful. Make it helpful. Make it, allow it to connect with people. But, yeah, overdoing it, I think that's certainly something to, to stay away from. That's awesome. That's actually quite a good note to, to finish with because... Again, it points to that breathing space you need to give people to think about it and interact and engage with it. Absolutely. I think, I think this whole, this, it all boils down to that human element. Keep in mind that I'm human, you're human, the people on this graph are human, you know, social media, we're, it's, it's a conversation amongst people. And yes. so keeping that in mind, respecting the people that we're having conversations with, it, it all flows naturally from that point, I think. That's brilliant. And with that, we are gradually coming to the end of our show for today. Um, we looked at data, we looked at the signals, we looked at C to see how everything connects. And what is becoming a more and more apparent is that the more we actually look at data, the more we focus on metrics, the more we focus on technicalities and techniques, the more the human element matters, the more the people behind everything acquire importance. Essentially, in a data-driven world, data comes from us. It's the result of our interactions, our engagement, our activities. Everything we do has a point, it has an impact, and it matters. That means that we all matter. People really actually do matter, and that is really disruptive. It disrupt it's disruptive in terms of marketing, in terms of brand values, in terms of connecting. When we matter in a data-centric world, well, it's no longer a world of machines or even a world of data. It's a world of people. And that's worth, well worth bearing in mind. Until next time, this is David Amerland. Thank you very much to both Virginia and Mindy, and certainly John Dietrich from Nodex.